Franklin Delano Roosevelt to solemnly swear. I, I, yes, Truman, do solemnly swear. I, Dwight D. Eisenhower, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, Lyndon Baines Johnson, do solemnly swear. I, Richard Billhouse Nixon, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of the presidency of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. From George Washington to Richard Nixon, the 37 presidents in the history of the United States have sworn to that oath symbolic of the nation's highest office. We shall hear six of those presidents, the 32nd through the 37th, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, and Richard Nixon, voicing their views of the awesome, exalted, at times perhaps wretched office they held. First, a sound capsule of four decades of recent history in the words of these six presidents, words which give definition to our times and to our lives. This generation of Americans has a rendezvous with destiny. I see one third of a nation still proud, still clad, still nourished. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. America hates war. Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign war. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. We look forward to a world founded upon four essential human freedoms. We shall not settle for less than total victory. I only wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to witness this day. The forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. An American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. The Charter of the United Nations, which you are now signing... The Cold War began to overshadow our lives. I'm Harry S. Truman. I work for the government, and I'm trying to keep my job. We're out to win this election, and we're going to do that on the second day of November. McCarthyism. The corruption of truth, the abandonment of our historical devotion to fair play. Federal fair employment legislation with enforcement power is greatly needed, and it ought to be on the books, and I'm going to keep fighting for it, come hell or high water. If we let the Republic of Korea go under, some other country would be next. I accept your summons. I will lead this crusade. I shall go to Korea. Forces of good and evil are masked and armed and opposed, as rarely before in history. An armistice was signed almost an hour ago in Korea. This struggle we now are in, we call the Cold War. This is light against dark, freedom against slavery. It is godliness against atheism. Don't join the book burner. We and other nations have a great responsibility to promote the peaceful use of space. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. If Indochina goes, several things happen right away. We stand today on the edge of a new frontier. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. This was a struggle of Cuban patriots against a Cuban dictator. All of this offensive buildup a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. I believe we should go to the moon. I have today signed an executive order providing for the establishment of a Peace Corps. It's their war. We can help them, but they have to win it, the people of Vietnam, against the communists. A great leader is dead. A great nation must move on. We have the opportunity to move not only toward the rich society, and the powerful society, but upward to the great society. This administration has declared unconditional war on poverty. Today, 
we begin to be masters of our environment. We are sometimes forced by an adversary to back our beliefs with steel, just as Lincoln did. We will not be defeated. The looting and arson and plunder and pillage which have occurred are not part of a civil rights protest. Tonight, I have ordered our aircraft and our naval vessels to make no attacks on North Vietnam. I shall not see, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. In the orderly transfer of power, we celebrate the unity that keeps us free. After a period of confrontation, we are entering an era of negotiation. The killing in this tragic war must stop. We shall do whatever is required to safeguard American lives and American honor. And so tonight, to you, the great silent majority of my fellow Americans, I ask for your support. I am today ordering a freeze on all prices and wages throughout the United States for a period of 90 days. Our goal is something Americans have not enjoyed in this century full generation of peace. The meeting between the leaders of China and the United States is to seek the normalization of relations between the two countries. The United States and the Soviet Union are on the threshold of a new relationship. A lot of history is determined by the one man who occupies the office of President of the United States. What manner of power resides there? Let us look into this first office of the land through the eyes of the six men who have last held this position. This is a profile of the presidency, drawn in the words of the men who have been president. First, some general impressions. Harry Truman. White House is a very pleasant place to live, but it's just like living behind an iron fence or behind bars, really. I used to call it the Great White Jail. Dwight Eisenhower. It is truly, I think, the most powerful uh, position in the free world. John Kennedy. I would say that the problems are more uh, difficult than I imagined them to be. The responsibilities placed in the United States are greater than I imagined them to be. And there are greater limitations upon our ability to bring about a favorable result than I had imagined them to be. A similar view, Richard Nixon. When you come into office, the presidency, uh, one has ideas as to what he can accomplish. Uh, and he believes he can accomplish a great deal even though he may have a Congress that is not part of his own party. Uh, and then after he gets in, he finds that uh, what he had hoped in terms of achieving goals uh, will not be as great as uh, the actual performance turns out to be. Lyndon Johnson. I've watched it since Mr. Hoover's days, and I realized the responsibilities it carried and the obligations of leadership that were there and the decisions that had to be made and the awesome responsibilities of the office. Thomas Jefferson said the second office of the land was an honorable and easy one. The presidency was a splendid misery. Once more, Richard Nixon. Theodore Roosevelt called the presidency a bully pulpit. Franklin Roosevelt called it preeminently a place of moral leadership. And surely one of a president's greatest resources is the moral authority of his office. And again, Harry Truman. I've made the statement many a time that there are about 15 million people in the country that can afford to have a representative in Washington to look after their interests in addition to the congressmen and senators that they have there, and they're called lobbyists. There's nothing wrong with them. They have a perfect right to do that, but there are 150 million people that can't afford that. They have but one man in the government to look after their interests, and that's the President of the United States. He's the lobbyist for 150 million people, and when he ceases to be that, those people are in a pretty bad way so far as the government of the United States is concerned. The presidency, a splendid misery. The president, a lobbyist for all the people. The interpretations of the office have varied virtually with each office holder. The Founding Fathers created the presidency as one of the three divisions of federal power within the framework of the Constitution. 